The Wright brothers used two of them on the world's first powered flight and they've been in use ever since. But how did the propeller get us into the air and keep us there for more than 100 years? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 18 in the Principles of Flight series. Propellers have now been in use for well over 100 years and whilst jets have taken over the responsibility for most of international and long haul travel, you still see propeller driven aircraft very often on domestic flights and short haul flights in general. In this class we're going to be taking a look at the propeller and our previous lessons on aerodynamics, airflow and general wing design will help to better understand the propeller and how it is used to generate thrust that we essentially need for flight. So to start off with, we will just define some parts of the whole propeller system. So you have the blades here. They are arranged around the blade hub, which is attached then to the engine drive shaft. Covering the blade hub is quite often a device known as a spinner, which is purely an aerodynamic device in order to reduce the form drag of the propeller. The area that the blades spin around in is known as the blade propeller disc. Propellers are essentially small wings all mounted onto this blade hub at their root. So they share a lot of the terminology that you get with wings, such as the leading edge, the trailing edge, the cord line, which is the line between the trailing edge and the leading edge. There are, however, some differences as well. The blade angle is the angle between the plane of rotation, which is, if you imagine this is rotating like this, the plane of rotation is actually this flat surface here. So this dotted line in here, and the angle between that and the cord line is known as the blade angle. This is similar to the angle of incidence on a, a regular wing. This angle is measured at a distance at 75% of the propeller length. So the blade angle is measured at 0.75 of the radius of the propeller. The reason for this is most propellers twist as they go towards the tip. So a standard point has to be chosen for measurements and for some reason it was settled on as 75% of the length. So in terms of the size of this blade angle, if you describe something as fine pitch, that means that it's closer towards the zero which would be completely vertically mounted like this. And if something's coarse in pitch, it would be closer towards 90. So you would have the cord line up around here. As well as the blade angle, we also have an angle of attack, which is the same as with regular wings. The angle of attack is the angle between the relative airflow and the cord line. So it's this angle in here for your alpha. And you also have something known as the helix angle, which is the other one in here. So the blade angle is made up of the helix angle plus the angle of attack. Now we can describe a propeller, we will look at how to actually generate the thrust force. Basically think of a propeller as a series of wings that produce a force. In a helicopter the wings are mounted horizontally to produce the lift and a propeller you basically mount it vertically and that's how you produce the thrust. First we're going to be taking a look at a fixed pitch propeller which means the angle is constant at that 0.75 radius that we discussed before. So the reaction force is generated in the same way that a normal airfoil works. There's an angle of attack between the relative airflow and the cord line. It generates a force off at an angle, the reaction force, the resultant force, and then we can resolve that into the forward component, which is our thrust, and the other component, which would normally be drag, is still drag but it's known as torque drag because it's rotational drag. To overcome this torque drag you have to then match the amount of drag with the engine. That's why you have to have an engine because it has to overcome this torque drag. So you would have an equal and opposite reaction force coming in here which would be known as the shaft torque. It's the torque that comes off of the shaft of the engine. Something interesting about propellers is that the forward speed and RPM of the engine will alter the angle of attack. So if we think about our relative airflow in here, of being made up of two components. This one down here is the RPM, the speed of the engine. 
and this one in here is the forward speed. If we increase the forward airspeed, for example, let's make it go all the way over here, we therefore make the triangle a different shape and our angle comes in slightly differently. As you can see with this new forward, faster forward speed, but with the same RPM, we've actually managed to reduce our angle between the cord line and the relative airflow. So, as the speed increases, our angle attack decreases. A similar situation would happen if we change the RPM value. So we have our original condition over here. If we were then to increase the RPM and stretch our triangle down here, for instance, whilst maintaining the same forward speed, then our relative airflow will come in at a steeper angle. You can see here that larger RPM has stretched our triangle out and now the angle between the cord line and the relative airflow has increased. So we can say as the RPM goes up, the angle attack also goes up. We can't only consider the blade angle of attack at 0.75 radius. We need to consider the whole length of the blade. So the blade tip rotates through the air faster simply because it has more distance to cover. This means that the rotational speed at the tip, the RPM at the tip is much higher. And that means that our triangle gets stretched out more. We got higher RPM, which means we've got a higher angle of attack. And that means at the wing tip, we actually produce more thrust than at the wing root, simply because of this higher RPM. If we didn't do anything about that, that would lead to the wings bending. The root would produce a certain amount of lift and the tip would produce this more lift and it would bend forward like this. So in order to correct this problem, the designers will incorporate a twist that will artificially lower the blade angle so that the higher RPM is compensated for and we have a more even uh, production of thrust along the length of the propeller. So in that previous example, we were looking at what's called a fixed pitch propeller, where the blade angle is always at a fixed size. This means that it can only operate at its highest efficiency um, at one specific RPM and one specific forward speed. If you think about it as a coefficient of lift versus alpha graph, you would have this maximum efficiency where you're producing the most amount of coefficient of lift, but you know, coefficient of thrust essentially in this case, you would produce that value only at one specific angle of attack, which would only come at one specific forward speed and one specific RPM. So you obviously don't fly an aircraft at one speed the whole time. So it can only be efficient for a very short period of time. So there are a few ways to get around this. The first is with something called a two pitch propeller, which unsurprisingly has two pitches, pitch being synonymous with a uh, blade angle. So it has two blade angle options. It'll have one which is quite fine and one which is quite coarse, and they'll each be optimized for different parts of the flight. So you'll have like a very specific cruise speed where you'd use something along the lines of this, and you'd have a very specific climbing RPM and speed where you would use the other uh, value for pitch. Another type is called the adjustable pitch propeller. Very creative name because it means that the pitch can be adjusted. It basically can go from fully fine, which would be zero, to fully coarse, which would be 90. And this allows for a large range of speeds and RPMs and the efficient angle of attack can always be achieved. So for example, during takeoff with a slow forward speed, the pitch would be set quite fine generate lots of forward thrust and then as we speed up we know as we speed up our angle of attack goes down that means that we would have to artificially increase the angle of attack to maintain the same amount of thrust and we would coarsen off as we get faster and faster third type of propeller is called a constant speed propeller and it differs from the adjustable pitch propeller because the adjustment is done automatically so an adjustable pitch propeller is manually controlled. You have to physically set the pitch, whereas a constant speed propeller, a governor system will take over and make sure that the optimum angle is always there to achieve um, the best amount of thrust. 
So a cool feature of fully adjustable propellers is the ability to generate reverse thrust, which is essentially a large increase in drag. So if we continue to fine off, as in get it closer and closer to zero, the pitch of the blade and take it lower than zero, then we'd end up with a negative angle of attack, as you can see here. You keep, it would be over here, you keep adjusting it, keep adjusting it, and then eventually you end up in the negative range and you produce a thrust in the opposite direction or a reaction force in the opposite direction, should I say. Part of that is a huge increase in drag or reverse thrust. And the other part is a large increase in that torque drag. That torque drag will have to be overcome in the normal way by the engine. So when we have an engine failure in a propeller aircraft, we can have an effect which is known as windmilling. So windmilling is similar to reverse thrust, but slightly different. So if we take away all the shaft torque, all of the RPMs of the engine, the generated torque drag in normal conditions will start to slow the RPM more and more and more. And eventually we will get to a point where the RPM value is so low that our relative airflow becomes very stretched out. That triangle that I'm talking about would become very stretched out. You have a huge component, which is forward speed and a very sl uh, small component, which is the vertical RPM value. That can lead to negative angles of attack, even if the blade angle is still positive. And that generates a reaction force, but instead of angling up the way like this, it angles down the way like this. So you would still have this drag value, and we'd also have some torque produced aerodynamically, which essentially takes over the roll of the engine and starts to continue spinning the propeller. This is how a windmill works. The forward motion of the air turns the blades and spins the propeller round. Unfortunately, if our engine is stopped, we don't want this increase in drag uh, because that will reduce our glide distance essentially. So to counteract this, we increase the blade angle until we get to a fully coarse position and that will stop the uh, reaction force coming in and hindering us. The difference between reverse thrust and windmilling is engine power. With reverse thrust, the reaction force is angled up the way and the torque drag component has to be overcome by the engine. And with windmilling, it's angled down the way and therefore pulling the engine round and you don't need the power from the engine to actually create this effect. So an important design consideration when designing propellers is the propeller must be able to absorb the power produced by the engine and it must generate sufficient torque drag to match that shaft drag or else the propeller could accelerate way too much, speed up and brake. So there are a few ways to do this. First is just to make the blades longer. Um, they'll take up more area, they'll have more power um, and they'll be able to produce more of that torque drag to match the shaft drag. However, this can increase the speed of the blade tips to very undesirable levels, such as close to the speed of sound, which can lead to like miniature sonic booms. And they also take up a lot of space. If you have a really long propeller, you've got to be very high up off the ground just to account for the space of it. So this wouldn't be our first choice. The next choice is to do something called increasing the solidity. And the solidity is basically the ratio of the propeller front area to the propeller disc area. Remember the disc is that area that it sweeps, the area that it covers as it spins. So there's a few easy ways to do this. The first is to just, if you think of this as our normal propeller, is to just increase the cord thickness. So you widen the blades and that'll take up more of a proportion of the disc than if you have thinner blades. The next is to add more blades. Again, you've got the same uh, disc area, but you're covering more of it in that blade space. And a third option is you would have two sets of propellers both mounted on the same shaft. These And they would rotate in different directions and that essentially covers a lot of area of the disc at any one time and that's called contra-rotating propellers. So while propellers are good at creating thrust they have a few side effects that you need to be aware of. The first is the torque reaction effect. So for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction and due to the clockwise rotation of the propeller, 
Um, when talking about rotations, it's always from the pilot's perspective. So if I'm sitting in the front of the aircraft, looking out over the propeller, it would be rotating clockwise or right-handed, they call it. So with a clockwise rotation, you have an equal and opposite reaction force, which would be an anti-clockwise torque reaction force. So in an aircraft, that's felt as a roll to the left, a roll in the anti-clockwise direction. The second effect is known as the slipstream effect. Again, we're talking about a clockwise rotating propeller from the pilot's perspective. So the rotating propeller rotates air behind it and it spins behind it like this. And what happens is the air from the right-hand side of the propeller goes underneath the aircraft and then rises back up and ends up hitting the fin of the aircraft at an angle. That angle in there, this alpha in here, generates a reaction force. Generates a reaction force in this direction. And that'll cause us to yaw to this direction. It'll cause us to yaw to the left. Both of these effects are very obvious on takeoff because you're doing a very large increase in the speed of the propeller and you feel these effects a lot. So you'll notice it that to counteract both of these effects, you have to use some right rudder, which will correct the problem and generate a force in this direction. And that'll cause us to yaw back and keep us straight on the runway. The third effect is known as the asymmetric blade effect or P factor. I don't know why it's called P factor but this causes, again, a yaw to the left. The reason behind this is only apparent at high angles of attack. So when you're at high angles of attack, the downgoing blade, which will be the blade on the right, or the blades on the right, essentially the, the right-hand half of our disc, actually have to travel further through the air. You see this diagram, if you imagine this is spinning towards us like this, then the downward going wing in a half rotation actually moves through the air a bit more than the upward going wing. And because it's traveling further distance, it must be traveling through the air faster, which means our speed goes up, and that means our generated force goes up. So it leads to the situation where you have more thrust produced on the right-hand side of the propeller than the left-hand side which leads to a yawing motion round to the left, an anti-clockwise yaw. So in summary then, we have the propeller, which consists of the blades, the propeller hub, often with a spinner device attached on the front of it, and this area that it sweeps is known as the propeller disc. The blades themselves are essentially miniature wings, so they share a lot of the terminology you've got your trailing edge, your leading edge, and your cord line in between them. Where it differs though is the naming of the angles. So your angle between the plane of rotation and the cord line is known as your blade angle, often referred to as pitch. The angle between the relative airflow and the cord line is known as your angle of attack. And the difference between the two, the other angle in there is known as your helix angle. The relative airflow is changeable and is based on our forward speed and our RPM. So if we have an increase in forward speed, it means that our triangle gets stretched along the bottom more, our triangle of our relative airflow, uh, sorry, our forward speed and our RPM. So we can say that as the speed increases, as long as the RPM stays the same, the angle of attack will reduce. Same is true for RPM. If we increase the RPM, the triangle gets a bit warped. But in this case, as we increase the RPM, our angle of attack actually goes up. If we had a consistent blade angle, the whole length of our propeller blade, then we would come to the situation where our blade tip would produce more thrust than the blade root because the blade tip has a faster RPM simply because it's traveling more distance as it goes round. That would lead to a bending of the blades of the propeller, which is undesirable. So designers incorporate a twist to artificially lower our blade angle, our pitch, and that means that the angle of attack is consistent along the length 
So because we're only achieving our maximal angle of attack, our most efficient angle of attack at one specific combination of speed and RPM, that means we're only efficient at one exact airspeed and one exact RPM. That is unless we use a two pitch propeller, which has two options for that speed, an adjustable pitch propeller, which is manually adjusted and can be adjusted to any speed that we want, or we can use a constant speed propeller, which does that adjustment automatically. We can generate reverse thrust by decreasing uh, the pitch of our propeller beyond the zero to create a negative angle of attack. This produces a reaction force up and to the left in this case, and it means we've got an increase in drag as well as an increase in the torque drag. That increase in torque drag has to be overcome in the normal way through the engine. Another thing that can happen is windmilling, which is when we lose the RPM of the engine whilst we're still traveling forward. And that means that we have a negative angle of attack without having the negative blade angle that we do for reverse thrust. This leads to a reaction force coming off, uh, sloping down to the left in this case, which is an increase in drag, but instead of an increase in torque drag, it's just an aerodynamic torque, which actually continues to spin the blade and continues this effect. This increase in drag is very undesirable, so what we do is we make the blades fully coarse, set them to 90 degrees, which is known as feathering the aircraft, but, sorry, feathering for the propeller. Power absorption is necessary due to the excessive RPMs and forces that can be experienced if the propeller doesn't match the power of the engine. So to increase the power absorption of any given propeller, you can increase the length of the blades, but that comes with problems such as sonic booms at the wing, uh, sorry, the blade tips. So the more desirable option is just to increase the solidity can do that by increasing the cord length of each individual blade. You can add in more propellers, more blades, sorry, or you can add in another propeller which rotates the opposite direction, known as contra-rotating. So the side effects of a propeller are reaction torque, equal and opposite reaction. The propeller wants to take, rotate right, so everything else attached to the propeller wants to rotate to the left. The next one's the slipstream and that is when the rotating mass of air cuts underneath the aircraft, comes back up and then interacts with the fin to create a force which rotates us to the left, it yaws us to the left. And the last one is known as the asymmetric blade effect or the P factor. And basically at high angles of attack, the downward going wing travels further through the air. Because it's traveling further, it must be traveling faster. And that means that we generate more force on the right hand side of the blade than we do on the left hand side and that rotates us again to the left, it yaws us to the left anti-clockwise.